again, I'm Ushma Neal with the Journal of Clinical Investigation, here today for another in our series of conversations with giants in medicine. We are joined today by Dr. Jeffrey Friedman of Rockefeller University, a man who's been at the center of the discovery of molecular determinants of feeding behaviors and why we eat what we eat, and specifically, why we eat so much of what we eat. Alarm about obesity is sounded almost daily in the media in response to reports that its incidence has increased over the past three decades, with now more than one-third of American adults classified as obese. Friedman has spent his research career discovering and categorizing leptin, the hormone which plays a key role in regulating appetite and hunger. The story of his 1994 discovery of leptin is one of tenacity and determination, and we look forward to the chance to hear more about the events unfolding in its discovery. Do you think you could tell us a little bit more about your upbringing and what brought you to the stage of going to medical school? Well, I grew up in the suburbs of New York City um, with no great expectations uh, for anything other than muddling my way through life. Um, mm -hmm. I think in my family the expectations were that if you were reasonably good in school you'd end up being a doctor and that was the path I found myself on and ended up completing medical school and doing a residency, at which point I realized I wasn't so enamored of the idea of being a doctor and at that point uh, found my way into science. So I read that uh, you had a bit of a gap year in between the finishing of your residency and the starting of your fellowship and that was part of what set you on the path. Yeah, so um, I finished medical school when I was fairly young because I was in a six-year medical program, started a medical residency and in those days you needed to apply for medical subspecialty training about a year in advance. And I uh, missed the deadline and so when my medical residency was about to end I didn't have any uh, actual plans having uh, now been accepted into a fellowship program that was a year later. So I wasn't sure what to do with that gap year. Uh, one of my professors at Albany Medical College where I was training thought I might like medical research and so referred me to Mary Jean Creek at the Rockefeller University uh, to try research for a year. And what was her research on? She studied addiction and I was really excited at the time about the ways in which it was being learned that, it, that affective say, state um, uh, was uh, regulated by molecules. Endorphins and enkephalins had just been discovered. The opiate receptor had been characterized. And so the idea that molecules could regulate behavior and emotion was really exciting to me and I joined her lab for a year to help study some of the problems she was interested in. And it was during the course of your year there that she put you in touch with someone who was studying cholecystokinin, correct? That's right. So my project in that year was to um, develop a radium amino assay for beta endorphin. Radium amino assays are methods for measuring protein levels in blood and I uh, was charged with that task. The only difficulty was that I had absolutely no idea how to even begin going about doing it. Uh, there was a, another investigator at Rockefeller at the time, Bruce Schneider, who was quite expert in this. Uh, and so I spent a good deal of that year working with Bruce, uh, ostensibly to be developing a rate amino assay for beta endorphin. As it turns out, though, Bruce's interests were in the roles of cholecystokinin to control metabolism and appetite, and through that interaction, I learned a lot more about that topic. Now, at that point, uh, the mutants had been discovered and started to be characterized at Jackson Laboratory, the OBOB -OB mouse and the DBDB -DB mouse. So, so the there, yeah. there was some thought that cholecystokinin would be this circulating hormone that regulated hunger. Yeah, what happened was, uh, so let me back up, uh, Bruce had been uh, studying cholecystokinin because a role for it had been uh, invoked uh, to regulate appetite. And the idea was that cholecystokinin is released from your gut after you eat a meal. It circulates in your blood to stimulate pancreatic secretion and gallbladder contraction. But there was further evidence suggesting that it also acted on appetite centers in the brain to reduce food intake. And so the idea is when you eat a meal, cholecystokinin is part of the shutoff mechanism that terminates a meal. Uh, now, there was one other wrinkle to the story that had to do with the fact that in the late 1970s, Rosalind Yallo, who actually won a Nobel Prize for developing rate amino assays together with Saul Burson, uh, published a paper that the levels of cholecystokinin were reduced in a genetically obese strain of mouse known as the OB mouse. Uh, 
The OB mouse had been found by George Snell and colleagues in 1951 uh, as a recessive mutation that causes massive obesity. Uh, since that time, despite hundreds of studies, maybe thousands, no one had ever figured out what the primary problem with the OB mouse was. Yalo speculated initially that perhaps the defect was in cholecystokinin because it was an endogenous appetite suppressant. So the idea is you knock out the gene for a, an appetite suppressant, animals get fat. And so she published in the late 1970s a paper reporting that the levels of CCK are reduced uh, in OB mice and perhaps explain the cause of obesity in them. The only difficulty was that Bruce, with whom I was working, had the exact opposite set of results, that CCK levels didn't change in the OB mouse. And there was a bit of a controversy in the field at the time over who was right. I was sort of on the sidelines uh, aware of this uh, controversy and through that became interested in the OB mouse. Right. Now, do you ground your departure from medicine to this time where you finally decided, I want to be a research scientist instead? Yeah, I think during that year I really fell in love with working in a laboratory. I loved research for lots of reasons. And so through that year I was trying to decide whether to go on to do what was supposed to be gastroenterology training at the Brigham uh, or not. And at the time, I, uh, I was in a bit of a quandary. All my colleagues were out in practice starting their lives. I was not sure what I wanted to do. And I had a sense, this was 1980, 1980, that molecular biology was going to have a big impact on the future of research and science, which I think it has had. Uh, and so in order to figure out what to do, I wrote letters to a series of uh, people who were well practiced in the art of the black arts of molecular biology, uh, asking what I should do. Should I do a PhD, do a postdoc, go do my medical training and worry about it later? Um, and probably the most um, useful letter was from David Baltimore, uh, who didn't know me uh, at the time, uh, and wrote back and said that he thought the Rockefeller PhD program was very well suited to someone with my background, someone who had prior medical training. In fact, years later, um, I ran into Baltimore when he became president at Rockefeller, and he said, that letter was from you. Uh, I, you often show the letter that I had written him originally, asking what I might do to him. So with that and other inputs that I had received, I decided my best course was not to return to medicine, but rather start the PhD program at Rockefeller, which I did in 1981. With Jim Darnell. Right. So I joined Jim Darnell, who was also one of the early leaders in the burgeoning field then, at least, of molecular biology. So then how did you fixate on OB as your target? So in Darnell's lab, uh, I was studying liver gene expression, what turns genes on and off in, in liver, but I carried with me this interest in uh, the OB mouse. And so apart from my PhD studies, which focused on liver, together with Bruce Schneider and another fellow, uh, Don Powell, we cloned the CCK gene. And the reason we cloned it was in part so that we could position it on the chromosome map. And in 1983, with the newly cloned CCK gene in hand, we worked with another scientist, Peter Distachio at NYU, who was able to use a technique known as somatic cell hybrid mapping to position CCK on mouse chromosome 9. This was important because OB maps to map mouse chromosome 6. And so this excluded CCK as being the causal defect in the OB mouse, in a sense settling the controversy. Uh, but of course, that then raised the obvious question as to whether, as to what the OB gene might be if it's not CCK. And that question um, was sort of foremost in my mind as I was completing my PhD training. So then you established your own lab still at Rockefeller. So in 1986, yeah, I started my own lab, and it was with the idea to positionally clone the OB gene. Um, in today's era, it seems pretty obvious uh, what you would do. You'd basically take the genome from the OB mouse and the normal mouse and sequence it and look for a difference. And it's quite likely that one or two people working for a few weeks could uh, figure out what the defective gene was. Um, but, but at the time, you had to master any number of different gene-related techniques to try and narrow it down. So at the time, the, the resources were quite a bit different. And so what now would be a pretty trivial undertaking, at least technically, back then required a whole set of genetic and physical technical approaches to try to decipher what the gene was. 
So can you tell us a little bit about how the events unfolded towards your actual discovery? Well, the, I've actually had cause to look back at things I'd written early on in 1984 and 85 about how we were going to go out, uh, go about trying to find the gene. And I was quite gratified to see that the course that was laid out straight away was pretty much exactly the one that we uh, ended up following. And basically what one does is segregate the mutation in large genetic crosses mm -hmm. so that you can map DNA markers or RFLPs relative to the mutation. Based on that, we were able to find markers uh, that mapped within 0.1 centimorgans of the OB gene, which, which would correspond on average to 300 KB. And with that as a starting point, we cloned the DNA in the region of that marker, looked for genes, and uh, ultimately found one that was defective in the OB mice. And voila, eight years later, there's OB. You told me once a story about how you were so excited at the time about it that you didn't even let the PhD or the postdocs finish the experiments, but as your confirmatory experiments were, were unfolding, you went in and hybridized the blots yourself and did yeah. all the things. So it wasn't a matter of, I would have been perfectly happy for anybody else to do it, uh, to do the experiments, but no one else was around and I didn't really want to, I didn't feel like I was in a mental state to wait. Uh, what happened was uh, earlier in the, the relevant week, someone had found that one of the genes in the, in the region of the OB gene was completely fat specific. Now, we had spent a lot of time imagining where the defective gene might be expressed. No one really knew. And one of my great concerns was that it might be expressed in a tiny cell type, such as islets mm -hmm. uh, in the pancreas, that would make it rather elusive if you were basing at least part of the gene identification strategy on where it was expressed. Nonetheless, when we saw a gene expressed exclusively in, in fat in the region, uh, that captured our attention. And so the key question was, is the defective gene, um, uh, uh, is the gene defective in OB mice versus wild type? So I happened to know that one of the postdocs had labeled a probe that was used for the northern blot that showed expression in fat. Another had made blots anticipating this moment of RNAs from mutant and wild type animals. And so I went in that night after having called everyone and I was unable to reach them. So I set up the blot myself uh, and developed it late one night or early one morning on a Sunday. What was that moment like of uh, understanding that you had actually narrowed it down? It was pretty frickin' awesome. <laughs> and it was really one of the great moments of my life. I mean, basically there, are, there were two mut mutant uh, strains for OB. Uh, the first was identified from Snell, uh, by Snell in 1951. The second subsequent to that had never been published, but I developed close relationships with a number of people at the Jackson Laboratory who made reagents of that sort available. Um, and when we developed the blot, when I developed the blot at about five in the morning or so, four in the morning, uh, the result was pretty striking and clearly uh, indicated that the defect that we had in fact cloned OB. And the reasoning behind it is sort of important. There were, uh, in the first strain, the one that Snell identified, uh, there was no RNA expressed whatsoever. So the normal animal had a perfectly normal level of RNA in fat, but the mutant strain had no RNA. That's easy to explain, but it could be secondary to some other problem, that is the reduced expression in OB. The second strain actually had an increased level of RNA. And it was the fact that the two strains had RNA levels that moved in opposite directions that told me this had to be the gene, because if the primary if the changes we were seeing were secondary to some other defect, mm -hmm. the changes would have to be going in the same direction. The fact that the RNA levels were disparate between the two mutants said this had to be the gene and suggested at the time that uh, in the second mutant with the increased levels, there was a defect in the protein coding sequence with the secondary increase in the level of RNA. And this in turn was not only an indication uh, that we had found the gene, but was also consistent with some prior a hypothesis put forth by Doug Coleman uh, that the OB gene was a, was a hormone and that it was under feedback control. And the increased level with the speculation that this was due to a protein coding defect was completely consistent with that. And of course, it turned out to be the case. Now he had, Doug Coleman had stated for a long time that it took him years to overcome the dogma that obesity was not just a problem of willpower. 
that there was a molecular determinant of it, but that he was unable to get to that. So together, the two of you managed to at least change people's minds and advance that. And for that, you were awarded the 2010 Lasker Prize together with Doug Coleman. That must have been an amazing sort of recognition from your peers. Well, I mean, look, the Lasker Award is an incredibly great honor. Uh, and But I have to say that there was no professional moment I've ever had that matched actually that moment of developing the film and, and seeing the actual results. Uh, it, it, you know, people, other people have said it in their fields and it was true in mine. I mean, what you're looking at are blobs on a blot that are uninterpretable to most other people who are not used to looking at things in that way. But it revealed a really elegant and simple biological system configured by nature that to me is incredibly beautiful. And so it was a very uh, important moment. And I sometimes think that recognition of the sort uh, of the Lasker is in part uh, uh, really nice, not because it reminds you of that moment. So it keeps that moment alive, as does the research one continues to do. Amgen then went on to license leptin from Rockefeller, but soon after they started testing it, terminated their clinical trials for, to, to use leptin as a simple treatment for obesity. And you've stated even then that you knew that it probably wasn't going to be a panacea for the whole field, given that most people still produce leptin. Do you think there's going to be any sort of a pharmacologic way or a magic bullet to treat obesity? Right. So. Um, let me take a step back and then I'll answer that question. The short answer to the question is yes, I think there will be treatments, uh, <clears throat> but uh, the story of leptin as a potential treatment for obesity and its potential uh, as a future agent is a little more complicated. So leptin is the afferent signal in a feedback loop that regulates body weight. Its job, in a sense, is to make homeostatic, maintain homeostatic control of fat mass and this has important evolutionary considerations because it allows organisms to, to maintain a relatively stable weight, weight, balancing the relative risks of being too thin, which is starvation, or being too fat, which is susceptibility to predators. So you have this biological system that maintains body fat within a particular range. In the, in the OB mouse and similarly affected humans, there's a mutation in the gene. So there's no signal that's ever generated that there are adequate fat stores and animals and humans who have leptin mutations overeat voraciously. In both cases, if you replace the leptin, uh, these uh, body weight normalizes. And so leptin as a treatment for leptin deficiency is extremely robust, very potent, works beautifully, and it works very well for other leptin deficiency states even besides leptin mutations. However, most obese humans and most obese animals uh, are obese for other reasons that lead them not to be leptin deficient, but rather lead them to be leptin uh, resistant. And so it's well, well established that for most endocrine disorders, it's easier to treat a hormone deficiency than a hormone excess characterized by excess or increased levels of the hormone analogous to insulin resistance and diabetes. And we knew very early on that, that the diet-induced obesity, which is thought to represent a, an animal form of human obesity, um, uh, was associated with high leptin levels and, and leptin resistance. And so we were not clear about what the clinical utility of leptin would be in a case where there were already high endogenous levels. And it turned out that leptin by itself um, is not a particularly effective anti-obesity agent in that mm -hmm. uh, setting. We now know, however, that, there, that, that in, in retrospect, the, 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 the people in that trial may have been getting too much leptin because a subsequent, a subsequent trial actually with lower doses paradoxically had a greater effect. Um, and the most recent findings would seem to suggest that if you pair leptin with another agent, in this case the peptide amylin, you can get very robust weight loss with greater than 10% weight loss with the combination and significant weight loss with either one alone using a low dose of leptin. So it remains to be seen whether that combination emerges as part of the clinical armamentarium for doctors treating obesity. Um, it's a little too early to say about that, but I'm pretty confident that as um, a deeper understanding or an evolving understanding of the neural circuits that respond to leptin is developed, that new treatments will emerge. Right. Um, I should add one thing, though. 
I think the key point, however, is that when we talk about treatments for obesity, um, it's important to think through carefully what it is we're treating. I think what we should be treating when we treat obesity is health, uh, not a cosmetic problem. And the importance of understanding that is that you don't need to normal, a quote normalize body weight to reap a health benefit. Modest amounts of weight loss in the range of 5 to 10 percent are often more than adequate to improve the comorbidities associated with, di with obesity such as diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and so on. So I'm pretty optimistic that in time there'll be ever increasing numbers of agents that will cause enough body weight loss to improve health. Whether or not we can develop medicines that will, quote, normalize body weight is less clear. On the other hand, I'm not sure that's worth doing in the first place. Right. In 2003, you wrote an article for Science Magazine. It was more of a perspective piece called A War on Obesity, Not on the Obese, wherein you commented a lot more about the societal implications of weight gain, and you even opined that in today's age with the free availability of calories, it's amazing that anyone is thin anymore. So what do you see as the societal implications for the massive amounts of obesity that we're seeing? Are we in an obesity epidemic in the United States? Well, I think it, whether or not there's an obesity epidemic depends a lot on how you look at the data. Um, first of all, it's not an epidemic, epidemic in the standard, the viral in, in, this, in, the, in the true definition of the word, which means horizontal spread. But setting aside that semantic issue, um, it really depends on, on how you look at the problem. Now, when people, what we clearly have is a highly prevalent, prevalent medical condition that needs to be addressed uh, to the best of our ability to do so. Now, the reason that some people refer to this as an epidemic or an exploding health problem is that if you simply count the number of people who exceed a threshold of BMI greater than 30, weight over height squared, you can see a steady rise over the decades that's pretty that seems pretty significant. Uh, the problem is that, that it's well established in epidemiology that if you have a distributed trait and a fixed threshold above which you refer to an individual as having a disease, the curve doesn't have to move very far for you to get a huge increase in the number of people who exceed that threshold. So over the same intervals where you see dramatic increases in the number of people over BMI 30, the curves actually haven't moved that far, which means that average weight hasn't changed very much. In fact, over the same intervals where body, uh, body mass by ob where obesity rates have said to increase over a third, you see maybe a seven to 10 pound weight change. And so I think how one looks at the problem or the changes depends a lot on whether you say increase in obesity of one third in a decade in the US versus average weight gain of seven to 10 pounds. I should mention that the system of which leptin is a part doesn't control weight to the pound, and seven to 10 pounds on average is well within, I think, the locus of people's personal control uh, to change. So do you think that there is a need for both changes in pharmacology as well as behavior here? There's never going to be just a way to treat just one? Well, so in a way the question is, what, what would you tell an obese person now who had a health problem? It turns out the things I would tell an obese person now is pretty much the same thing I would tell a lean person uh, or a person of average weight. Eat a heart healthy diet, exercise, and if you are overweight and have a comorbidity, do your best to lose a modest amount of weight, say seven to 10 pounds, because that's often enough to improve your health. I don't think there's any cause to tell someone who's greatly overweight um, uh, that they need to, to weigh you know, I have a BMI of 22. Um, so um, I think pharmac pharmacological therapy should be reserved for those cases where these sorts of um, more, uh, less extreme uh, recommendations uh, are not working. Now, the point here really is that, that I think everybody operates within a range and 10 to 20 pound weight loss is difficult but achievable. Many of the people, however, who are most severely afflicted by obesity and its comorbidities weigh 50 or 75 pounds above, quote, ideal body weight. And I think for those individuals, uh, oftentimes these behavioral measures are inadequate, and that's, that's where pharmacolog pharmacologic interventions uh, would probably be best considered. Right. Your more recent work has moved um, 
into things like radio wave control of nanoparticles to control insulin secretion um, and ribosomal phosphorylate, phosphorylated ribosomal capture um, without looking at my notes. So are you looking towards the next wave of how to incorporate uh, pharmacology in, towards treating the problems of obesity? Well, you know, we're not uh, as focused, although we do have some research dedicated to trying to find new pharmacologic targets that we might be able to use as the basis for new treatments. I think the thing that we, I would most like to understand um, is how the complex information that's relevant to whether or not an organism begins to, to eat, um, uh, to, to understand how that information is processed and where it's processed. So whether or not we initiate feeding behavior uh, is dependent not just on leptin, but many other factors, gut hormones and nutrients, um, sensory factors like taste and smell and vision, emotional factors such as fear, and in humans also the cognitive desire perhaps to eat more or less. All these factors are relevant to whether or not we initiate feeding. Not only do we not understand how complex information of this sort is represented to generate a decision in, a brain, in, the, in the brain, we don't even know where that information is processed to make that decision. And we'd like to understand um, in, a, in a more coherent way how and where that, that processing happens. Now to do that, there are two technical um, challenges that we would need to address, or at least in our thinking on the matter. One would be means for identifying neurons in critical regions of the brain that we might infer play a role to regulate feeding. And then two is a way to test the function of those neurons once they're identified. That is, does activating or inactivating that neuron change feeding? And that was the challenge that we've been uh, trying to address for some time. Um, in the first paper you referred to, phosphoribosome capture, or phosphotrap as we describe it, we, we, develop, we, we report the development of a method that allows you to get RNA to transcriptionally profile neurons uh, that have been activated or inactivated in response to a stimulus. And we hope to be able to use that to ask whether or not the same or different neural populations are changed by relevant inputs in a given part of the brain. The hope is that that will yield uh, genetic markers that we can then use to target other reagents to those cells to change their activity. And this can be easily done uh, nowadays using optogenetics with a light activated channel where you can change neural activity using light. More recently we've been trying to explore alternative uh, approaches to the same end using radio waves, but the objective is the same. You've trained many different people over the years, so what do you think are the most important ingredients in being a good mentor to young trainees? Well, I, you know, um, I don't know what the, the, the right answer to that is. I can tell you the way I like to work my lab, which is that uh, I, I want people to really play as active a role as they can in developing their own ideas and their own programs. And I like to think of each of the people in my lab as sort of a, um, a PI who doesn't have to raise uh, their own money. And so I think people do better and are most invested and learn uh, most by helping, by feeling as much ownership as they can of what it is they do. And I, to a large extent, view my role as enabling them to the extent I can to pursue the things they're most interested in. I think the key caveat, however, is that it has to be um, in an area that I actually know something about. Uh, if people come to my lab and have a great idea, but it's not something I have much of a feel for, then I'm not particularly useful in terms of helping to guide or help them when things maybe uh, need a course correction. So what kind of advice do you give to your trainees? You know, I, I, I had so many advantages. It's, I'm not sure my experiences would be that instructive. I was really fortunate because I had Howard U support very early, and so a lot of the pressures for getting funding uh, were not um, an issue for me in the way they otherwise might have been. And I, I think it's really tough to, uh, to get started when you have, in addition to trying to plot your scientific course, you have all this pressure to raise money in a, a, a difficult climate, at least for the moment, for funding research. I mean, the, 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 the statement I, would, I often make is to try to figure out the biggest question you think you can answer.
And I don't think that's bad advice, but it, I think it's a little narrow insofar as it ignores a lot of the other elements that, that are required to, to sort of make, make that happen. And it was sort of a luxury for me to be able to take a big risk um, on a long-term project. Uh, uh, and it had, not been, had it not been for use funding and the cultural climate at Rockefeller, it might have been much more difficult for me to have taken my own advice. Do you think you ever considered an alternate career? Well, I mean, I would, I would you know, again, I've had the luxury of doing something I really like to do, which I don't think most bankers feel, although they might. Uh, I mean, I, I like the operation, operational aspects of the day-to-day -day, uh, things I do, independent of any of the sorts of other motivations someone might have. So I, I, I could imagine myself uh, uh, as a writing about history. I really like history. I could imagine myself as a sports writer. Um, those two come to, yeah, but professional athletes probably out of the question because it requires some ability for that. So I'd probably go with history or uh, sports writing. Not a, not a bartender? Could be a bartender, but I, I think I'd probably consume too much <laughs> of, on my own.